Hi and welcome to this week's Behind the Sounds. I have with me from Nashville the wonderful Mark Beeson here. How are you? Thank you for being here. I'm doing great, Leah. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Um, we just had a little chat, obviously, and um, such an incredible career you've had. Uh, there's too much to talk about, actually. It's been absolutely incredible. But just kind of to start off, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into kind of country music and, and songwriting and um, where it kind of started for you? Well, you know, it's a it's a it's a long story. But I'll give you the, the uh, micro version. Uh, I kind of grew up, I'm a lot older than everybody, <laughs> everybody that I work with, you know, like I'm in my 60s. So, uh, you know, I grew up at a time when, when, uh, and I was influenced by artists uh, that did everything. Mm -hmm. They sang everything, they wrote everything, and they played everything. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that's what everybody did. So I kind of started writing in the same way I was learning how to play guitar and learning how to sing because I thought you had to learn all three. It really wasn't uh, until much later that I, that I, it, that it really hit me that there's people that just do, just play, like play on records. There's people that just write songs, you know, and there's just artists that don't do either. Anyway, uh, cause I was kind of, you know, had tunnel vision about that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so <clears throat> it kind of, the writing part, I didn't really, I don't think I fully embraced it until uh, I was, uh, had moved to Nashville, which was in my mid thirties. Uh, I, I, uh, I spent 10 years in LA before I came to Nashville, trying to, you know, trying to figure out what I was out there. And, uh, you know, I was always kind of an artist first for the yeah. longest time. And, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, and just by a twist of fate, I ended up having an opportunity to come to Nashville. And, you know, I mean, so I went from this place where I was in, this was in the eighties in LA and I'm carrying around an acoustic guitar at the same, you know, it was the exact wrong time to be there playing acoustic guitar. I mean, that whole era was, was over. And all the people that influenced me like Jackson Brown and the Eagles and, you know, all those kind of people, that music was, was not on the forefront anymore. All of a sudden it was like the glam bands, you know, the spandex and the, you know, permed hair and everything. And, <laughs> and so carrying an acoustic guitar around was like, uh, I might as well have been carrying a tuba because, <laughs> because it didn't, you know, I was really in the wrong place. Although I learned a lot when I was there and it was a great experience. Uh, but when I came to Nashville, all of a sudden what I was doing kind of lined up. Suddenly, yeah. I, suddenly, what I was playing and what I was influenced by kind of lined up with what was happening here. And, uh, and then I really, you know, once you come to Nashville and you, you, you realize there's an entire culture of songwriting here that honestly, if you, if you don't come here, you don't really get it. Yeah. What, that, what that culture is and how deep it is and how much respect there is for the craft of songwriting here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's really what brought me, focused me on songwriting. I had, I, I did three different records in the nineties, trying to still, trying to do that, the, uh, the artist thing. I, I spent a lot of record company money and they never made any money off of me. Uh, so I finally got my, finally got it together and, and just, you know, uh, just really totally focused on writing. Yeah. And that's what I've done. That's what I've done since, you know, for the last, fully for the last 20 years at least. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I had a little success as a writer in between artists. Yeah. Between records, you know, it's funny. I never cut any of the songs that other people had hits with. I don't know yeah. what, Always I don't know. Play, I, had, <laughs> I don't know what my, I don't know what my thing was, but honestly, I probably wouldn't have had a hit with it. It would have been a waste of a song. So it's good the way it worked out. Yeah. And was it always country you focused on? Because I know you kind of got a bit of background in, in other genres as well. But what I was it that kind of led you to country? It, it really, I mean, I really, you know, my uh, knowledge of country was uh, what I heard uh, growing up in, in Illinois uh, in the 60s. Uh, and it was just, radio just played, they just played hits. And there was a station out of Chicago, WLS, it was like this really powerful AM station. 
mm -hmm. and you know, mono, everything's mono, everything's mixed mono and everything. <laughs> and, uh, and so you could hear the Rolling Stones and Tammy Wynette back to back yeah. on that station because they only played hits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could hear Satisfaction and then, you know, Stand By Your Man. And it was, uh, so, I mean, that was my intro to what country was. But then I didn't, but I was a little guy then, so it didn't really hit me. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and I grew up for years, I really thought country was, you know, hay bales and hillbillies mm -hmm. and all of that. And, and I think so, to some extent, that's kind of what it was on, in some way. And, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't come here earlier than I did. But, I, but when I was in L.A., I, I made a conscious effort to listen to country radio, the country station out there, the big L.A. station. And there were some things that I thought, whoa, man, that is really good. Like, I was pretty blown away by, by, some, uh, by some of the acts that I heard um, from, the, from the late 80s and some of the songs. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got here, I was, I was eager and when I got a chance to write with some writers, um, ironically, I, it was a record company that brought me here because they thought they wanted me to do records. And I, I did a record for them. It didn't work out. But the best part of it was that I got introduced to the writing community through that. Mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden, I realized the labels of country and pop and all the rest of that. It was just, I mean, here it's about the craft. And I could hear and you could hear a great song and it could be somebody doing a real twangy country song, but if it's a killer song, you're just like, wow, that's just a great song. Yeah. You stop kind of thinking in terms of, of genres when you're, when you're immersed in the craft. Yeah. I, I had, I, my respect changed a lot. And, and also I think it, it, it kind of came, it really came out of the, that whole hillbilly thing, that, that persona, that was that disappeared yeah completely it kind of got left by the wayside yeah and when you when you moved there did you think this is where i'm going to be long term or was it kind of just oh i'll go check it out see what it's like and then make the move back to la no i i knew i was never going to go back to la because but seriously mostly because i recognized um uh that I had found a place where what I was doing was true to me and it fit. Mm -hmm. I had never felt that before. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I used to go into offices with my acoustic guitar publishers and whatever in LA sometimes. And they would, I could have played Led Zeppelin, but they had acoustic guitar and they would say, Oh, you ought to go to Nashville. They had no, they didn't have any idea about Nashville, but they would just say it because, you know, I had an acoustic guitar. Or something. Yeah. And so it's funny, one of the first meetings I had when I came to this town, I went to, I went to the office and I came in there and I played some of my stuff and that guy, the guy goes, man, you sound pretty pop. Have you ever thought about going to LA? <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, and yeah. I realized, I realized, man, you just have to do what you do and you have to find the place where what you do works. And I, and I think I learned early on that this was the place for me. And also because it was an opportunity to really learn. Mm -hmm. you know, and to embrace the craft and to, you know, let go of ego and just be a student. You yeah. Know? Honestly, to this day, I still, the only reason I'm, I'm convinced the only reason I still have a career is because I still believe that, that the only way to progress uh, really in anything is to, is to approach everything as a student and not try and act like an expert or know it all or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's, that means you're retired. Yeah. When you when you're when you're not willing to learn anything anymore, you you're officially retired. And that trust me, I've written with a couple of kids in their twenties who've had a hit or two, and you can't tell them anything. <laughs> they, they know it all. And I'm yeah. you know one kid. I said, you know, you're retired and you don't even know it, kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. so it's all about being a student. And I embraced that when I came to this town. And there's so much to learn. And and I, I do believe that when you're around people that you perceive as being a lot better than you <laughs> yeah. that's that's an, an environment to learn yeah for sure it doesn't make it any easier it's still hard but it gives you a bar to, to, to reach for you know I think it's hard 
in a nebulous way if you're not in a place like this to know exactly where the bar is that you're trying yeah. to hit. You know? Sure. It's, it's a little disconnected listening to records. Even though you know something's great and you look at the names and you see who's written, it's still, you, you're, you're not necessarily in an environment where everybody you're around is like, bam, bam, it's gotta be here. Yeah. I don't know. That's why I'll never leave here. Yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously paid off for you though, because it just <laughs> been unstoppable since you, since you got to Nashville. Um, do you remember like what your first like cut was when you got here? What your first record was either on an album or on the radio? Well, it, ironically, the, the, first, uh, the first cut I had was a song called Even Now, and it was on a, on a band called Exile. Mm -hmm. uh, and Exile was a big band in the 70s and 80s. They were a big rock band, and then they moved over to country, and they made a very uh, smooth transition. And um, the guy who produced them, I got set up with, to write with, uh, uh, when I was still in LA. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lady at, at Warner Brothers in Nashville who had invited me to come is the one who set that up. And we wrote this song and it was, it was supposed to be, uh, we wrote a couple songs, we produced them, and it was supposed to be for my artist thing. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, and they didn't, they just didn't respond. And uh, and so Randy said, hey, you know, if they're not if they're not going for it, then I, I'm gonna be all right if I pitch this to Tim Dubois over at Arista because I'm cutting, I'm doing a record on on uh, on Exile. And I said, Yeah, go ahead. And so that was my it went to number eight, it was my first cut and my first single. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was so. Uh, Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I remember driving across the the overpass of Old Hickory and uh, I sixty five when that song came on. It was the first time I heard anything I ever wrote on the wow. radio. I, I had to pull over. <laughs> I had to pull over to the side. It was. I was so shocked. <laughs> it's so a once in a lifetime thing, isn't it? I mean, that that first time, that first song, first school, first time hearing it. Um, and I love that you, you can still remember that now. It must have been just incredible. But w was it a bit bittersweet because you had written it for yourself or was it just kind of, this is amazing? No, I felt like, I felt like, well, I think there was a lesson in how the music business works. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I also kind of, on, in some way, kind of felt like, okay, I've seen some artists hang on to songs and not let them go. Mm -hmm. uh, and... <laughs> I guess I guess there's certain artists that have so much conviction about what they do that yeah. and maybe be, they're so good that that they need to do that they yeah. need to but you know but I've also seen artists be so precious with songs that you know and and you can't you can't act like well that's the last song I'm, that's the last good song I'm ever going to write mm -hmm. you're going to write more songs and if nothing else, having a hit, even if it's not you, helps you uh, keep your publishing deal. Yeah. So, Definitely. you know, I don't know. Yeah, so it wasn't really bittersweet, you know, that much. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, it kick-started something amazing. You've had a ridiculous amount of hits over the years. Um, Martina McBride, Leanne Rimes, Big Kenny, all these amazing people. And then it just seems to kind of keep going for you. So I'm going to focus more so on the kind of last few years that you've written. But one thing, one song I wanted to speak about, which is kind of similar to what you've just said about artists either keeping songs to themselves or giving them away, is um, We Are Tonight, which Billy Carrington recorded. Yeah. So you wrote that with Sam Hunt and Josh Osborne, Josh Osborne and yeah. Sam recorded a version of it on his Between the Pines album. But yeah, can yeah. you tell me the story about that song and how that kind of went from Sam to Billy and they both kind of ended up recording it? Well, you know, it's interesting because you talk about um, artists. Uh, we were kind of talking about artist conviction. Uh, and there's there's some artists that... Uh, that young artist that will say things and you'll and you just have to just kind of re refrain from rolling your eyes. 
<laughs> because you know they take themselves too seriously or whatever, and you just want to you just want to shake them and go snap out of it. Yeah. You know, and and but Sam is I knew right from that was the first song that uh, Sam and Josh and I wrote, and uh, and Robin Palmer had set that right up, and it was before either one of them really had anything going on, yeah. and Sam didn't have a record deal yet, and uh, actually I think Josh just had his first number one and maybe um no no that was that was later no that was later this was before before um uh this was right before kenny had that come over song yeah which sam and, also recorded a version of <laughs> yeah right sam and, and josh yeah. and and shane had written that song mm -hmm. and, and it was uh, it was the first number one for all of them. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it was right at the beginning of, of for all of them. And uh, but it was before that 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 we wrote this song. And I remember we wrote it. And Shane was initially the producer on on uh, uh, on uh, on Sam. And they went in the studio and they spent money and and did a kind of it was more than a demo. It was like a master. Mm -hmm. And it, it cut three songs, and I remember seeing Shane and Shane saying, "Please don't pitch this song because I think this is this might be the song that gets him the record deal." Mm -hmm. I said, "No problem. I'm not. I'm not going to mess with it." And I knew in the writing session, and and I, you could just be be around a guy like Sam, and you can you just you just take him seriously because he he just holds himself that way. You know, this guy knew who he was. And uh, so I respected him for that, and, and I wasn't going to let go of that. I wasn't going to pitch that song at all. Then one night, about six months later, um, I get this call, and I remember it was a Friday night, and it was Sam. And he said, he said, man, he said, you know, I love, I love We Are Tonight, but I, I just can't help feeling I'm like it's not, not exactly the lane I want to be in. Mm -hmm. And and I'm thinking, okay, I'm me, immediately I'm feeling kind of awkward because I'm thinking, is he saying, what is he saying? And is this going to be weird for Shane? I mean, I, I, I mean, I just, I said, I said, well, uh, okay, well, um, so did you talk to Shane about it? You know, he says, oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, so anyway, I just wanted to tell you, you know, if you want to pitch it, uh, do it we, yeah we'll let it go and i and i said i said okay all right i mean i'm i'm immediately worried because shane had asked me not to pitch it and i'm and so i thought well i don't want to do the wrong thing but he was so convicted and i thought all right so we got off the phone and i immediately i immediately sent uh an mp3 to uh, dan huff yeah dan Dan and I go way, way back, and I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean for that to sound like uh, uh, name dropping. <laughs> I just, I had just known. I had met Dan first out in L.A. back in the '80s before yeah. I came here, and he, he and his family moved here just about the same time I did. Yeah. And uh, and, uh, and Dan had started producing, and obviously was huge. Was 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 already a huge producer, and. Yeah. Um, and I just sent it to him, and uh, I said, I said, this song is going to hit the streets on Monday, and you've got it over the weekend. If you get a chance to listen to it and you want it, let me know mm -hmm. so I can tell them not to pitch it. Yeah. Uh, and he hit me. I remember he hit me on Sunday morning. He texted me, mm -hmm. and he said, he said, "Don't quote me on this, Beeson, but I'm telling you, I think this song is a, this song is a smash." Yeah. And 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 that was the first time he cut some of my songs in the past, but he never said that to me before. So I was really excited. And we initially, this is this is how uh, what a great guy Dan is, and how respectful Dan is of songwriters. I said, I think I said in the email, um, if you dig this. Would you take a shot with Keith? And 
when he hit me back and said, this is smash. And he said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll play for Keith. And, uh, he was a little bit vague about the reaction that Keith had other than, uh, other than he said, you know, we're kind of in a little bit limbo with Keith right now. And he said, I think, I think we could cut it on him, but I'm not sure that he's jumping up and down. And he said, but I am working on this, I am working on Billy Currington and they literally only need one more song. Wow. And this is exactly what they're looking for. Yeah. And, and I remember telling uh, Robin Palmer and Steve Markland, who were my publishers at the time, uh, what Dan had said. And they said, they said, give the damn song to Dan. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. do anything but make hits out of it. I don't care if he wants to cut it on Boxcar Willie, just give him the damn song. So I said, okay, you know. And so, you know, and he cut the fire out of that. That yeah. is a great track. And Billy sang, sang the hell out of it. And that's, that's also a big blessing about cuts is if, if the artist and the producer take it to the next level, you know, where you think it's pretty great and then they, they just make it. They take a, song, a strong song and make a great record. Yeah. And it, it, lifts, it lifts the whole thing. So that was a... That was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I hope I didn't ramble on too much about that. No, it's a, I mean, it's a great song. And it hit number one, did it, on, on the Airplay charts. So yeah. did you expect that when you kind of heard, oh, it's They Only Need One More Song, Billy's going to cut it. Did you ever think it was going to be like the single and a number one? Well, I mean, I, I definitely thought we had a shot at a single. Yeah. Uh, we had to wait for the second single. I thought, I thought it might be the first single because they were all jumping up and down about it over there. But. But uh, it ended up, you know, eventually being the single, second single, I think. And uh, I mean, songwriters never say, yeah, this is going to be a smash. It's going to be a number one because that's like, you know, that's like taking a gun and shooting, your, shooting yourself in the leg. You know, it's like, no, you never say that. <laughs> I mean, secretly you think, oh, you know, you have those, mm -hmm. those butterflies and you put them way in the back. Yeah. And you get and you get to writing, and you just look at the charts every Monday, and don't worry about it any time in between because there's nothing you can do about it. And then you just yeah. pray and cross your fingers. And sometimes the stars line up, and it worked for sure, definitely. And then another song. I'm just kind of going to focus on on a couple of songs from the past <laughs> few years that have just been absolute massive hits. Um, one of them, Josh Turner, Hometown Girl, which for anyone that ever hears that song, I don't know anyone that doesn't like it. <laughs> it's just oh. such a, uh, you know, driving down the road with the windows down, singing along, such a great song. Um, and again, was it number two, possibly even number one at here? Um, so went, to what, number one, went to number one on Country Air Check. I mean, so another one, another like smash hit. What was that like? Because Josh kind of had, he had such a great career and had a little bit of a dip. And then this was kind of his, his comeback almost. He hadn't had a big hit in a while. And then he yeah. releases this and it's just a smash for him. So what was that like writing that song? Well, it was, uh, uh, writing it was, was fun. I, I wrote it with uh, Daniel Tashin. And, uh, and this was before Daniel uh, was producing Casey Musgraves. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, it's just, it's all, it's a beautiful piece of history now how he went on to produce Golden Hour. Yeah. Uh, and uh, co produced Golden Hour and, and they won the Grammy. And, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But, yeah. but he, it was Daniel's, it was Daniel's first country single he'd ever, uh, yeah. ever had. And he'd been around for a while, but he's always kind of a producer and did some more kind of indie style music i think mm -hmm. uh, but it kind of fell together and uh, that song was a couple of years old when uh when they when they cut it yeah and uh ironically uh, I, I don't know if it's ironic but uh i had two singles come out about the same time it was hometown girl and this song called um uh it was blake shelton um Oh, I'm totally spacing on the title. She's now. got away with words. Is that <laughs> yes? yes. <laughs> away with words. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, sorry. Um, I'm having a pandemic moment. Uh, yeah, away with words. And he had had 17 number ones in a row. Mm -hmm. And so 
I remember Steve, uh, Steve, uh, who's my publisher uh, for both of those songs, and we were at a bar one night, and uh, and uh, honestly, if you had, so the Blake thing, <clears throat> because that song, uh, Way With Words, had a couple of lines in it that were kind of controversial for several country stations, mm-hmm. they only got it, they got it to seven. Mm-hmm. They couldn't, and so we managed to break the streak, 17 number ones, we broke it. <laughs> and, and then Josh Turner, who hadn't had a hit in like four or five years, yeah. was the number one. And, and you know, and that's the, that's the weird thing about the music business, is there's absolutely no way you can predict mm-hmm. what the outcome is. So no, in the beginning, you don't think, oh, this is gonna be number one. Yeah. You, might, you might think, well, we got a pretty good shot. But it's weird how every odd thing that can happen can happen. And uh, but I, I uh, uh, and hometown girl took forty eight weeks to go to number one. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> That's a but it long. Got there. <laughs> I mean, there were there were weeks that I, um, you know, I thought, oh well, it's this is it's going to die. Well, mm-hmm. they'll have they'll you know, they had a number of weeks that were were hard. Where like they didn't have any ads and it looked like oh well it's over, mm-hmm. and then they they managed to keep keep it going. Yeah, and it's as I say it's such a great. I mean, and I've seen videos of him performing it live, and it's a crowd favorite. It's a, and I think for a lot of people, obviously, we're just saying that like, he hadn't had a hit in a few years, so it was almost a whole new fan base as well, kind of reintroducing him. Um, mm-hmm. su- such a great song. Um, but with the, with the Blake one, so obviously you said it got to number seven, which is still such an incredible feat. Did it feel, was there anything kind of not disappointing, but obviously you were saying you can't predict anything, obviously it not going to number one. Did it feel a bit kind of, again, like a bit bittersweet or were you just kind of like, it's a hit, we're happy, number seven is great which yeah. it obviously is, because for a lot of people, number seven would be number one. <laughs> so what was that like? Well, I think it's it's kind of, you know, yeah, it's a little, uh, I mean, it's disappointing because you can't help but have expectations. If, mm-hmm. you're, if you have a single coming out on an artist that's had 17 number ones in a row, mm-hmm. I mean, you're not really thinking, wow, we're, we're probably going to break that streak. That's what the, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, they just, I, I applauded, uh, Blake for cutting that song because it was a little bit edgy and it was on the heels of his breakup with Miranda and and which by the way we didn't even it wasn't we didn't write it about that at all we had written before their breakup and uh, actually believe it or not we tried to get it to her first wow because it works male or female yeah it works both ways the universal feeling you know and I, I there have been times that i've played that song at writer's nights and gotten some pretty cold stares from women <laughs> and it's like and i you know it's, it's supposed to be kind of tongue-in-cheek and and it can and it's mm-hmm. works it's just it's supposed to be a funny play on words song about breakups and i mean if you can't laugh about it then yeah still still too close to home but uh yeah and and there were some there was a couple of lines in there they're like that well the one you know is she put a big f you in my future mm-hmm. it was about five stations that wouldn't play the song because of that line yeah and, uh, and they actually uh they actually called us the label uh and wanted us to write an alternate lyric for that no way. when the song got in the top 10 mm. so that those stations would play it but then it ended up getting all confused because they sent that version out with another line. And I can't even remember what the line is, but it was, it wasn't as good. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and there were stations that were confused about which version they were supposed to play. And, mm-hmm. and so, and it, it just got all screwed up. And so they lost the song at seven. And uh, I, I, I had a couple people at, at other labels tell me, you know, they didn't need those stations. They could have just rammed it up there to one with yeah. his momentum and everything. But hey, what are you going to do? It's just um, seven. I mean, I don't it's want never to, be and, taken away. That I don't sound, and I don't, you know, want that to sound um, um, like complaining or ungrateful at all. 
Exactly. It's just funny. It's just the the, yeah. the weirdness of of this business. Exactly, and as you obviously, as you said, at the same time, Josh's single went crazy. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just so I'm grateful for all of it. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's been awesome, and I know obviously with within the last few years there have been so many more singles, but I want to kind of talk about. You've had loads of releases this year already um, as a songwriter, um, which obviously considering the pandemic and the whole situation is incredible. Um, one of them I want to talk about because I saw when it was released, it had been kind of three years in the making, is uh, a song with Mitchell Tenpenny, uh, a release for him, which is here. So I saw when you put that out, um, that it had been kind of bubbling for did it three years. So how did that kind of come out? Because he's had a, a great few years. So what was that like? Well, um, uh, Jordan Schmidt and Mitchell and I wrote that, uh, gosh, I guess it was three, 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 maybe four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, that song for me is one of my, one of my favorite songs. I really feel like we really wrote that well. And and I love the melody. And Steve, first time he heard, it, he said, "God, that's a smash." And and you know, for whatever reason, I, you know, it just took a minute for Mitchell to decide to record it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like a nagging fishwife. I would call <laughs> him and say, "What are you doing? You have to, you know." And I never do that. Yeah, I never do that. But I really gave him grief about not cutting that song. <laughs> And and Jordan too. I said, "Come on, guys, this, you know." And and I and I even and I said, "I can't even pitch this to anybody, yeah, because nobody else can sing it but Mitchell." Yeah, it's it's rangy. It's not easy to sing, and he sang he sang it so well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they finally did it, I just thought, "Yes," you know. So and I love I love that record, and I love that song. And yeah. uh, they're both really great guys. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Mitchell's talent. He's uh, he's really great. And you're so right. He's got one of them voices that when you hear his songs, you you can't imagine anyone else singing them. He's yeah. got such such an incredible voice. Um, and then another artist who kind of has just again had an incredible few years and released her debut album earlier in the year. Um, Tenille Towns. I know you had a couple of cuts on that record. She's as I said, had an incredible few years. Um, what was it like kind of being a part of that record? Is it, is there a difference in being a part of someone's kind of debut record to being with someone that's kind of established almost? Well, um, I think the difference is more in terms of who the artist is. It's a bigger mm -hmm. difference for them than it is for the writer. I mean, I just, uh, uh, I remember Daniel, uh, telling me about her and uh, she was writing over at Big Yellow Dog and I had never heard of her and uh, and uh, he said he said let's I want to bring Tennille in on on uh, a couple of rights and uh, and I just I just fell in love with her just as a person she's just such a uh, an honest genuinely sweet kind person you know who's really trying to get better and and she's worked really really hard and i don't know any artists that have worked harder starting out than tenille has mm -hmm. and on everything that's asked of her and more and that she's general she's so generous and uh, does a lot of of uh, you know benefits and charity work and she's just uh, an amazing person and it was really fun writing with her and i love both of those songs and i love uh, I love the way they turned out, and I'm incredibly proud to have a couple songs on that record. I think she's a. I just think she's a. Uh, I think she's going to be really big. I really yeah. do. She's unlike anybody else. She's not cookie cutter, mm -hmm. uh, and and she has a lot of important things to say, mm -hmm. and nobody sounds like her. Yeah. Again, she's got one of them voices. Yeah. Yeah. Her style is just, I mean, I just, I love her. I just love that girl. Yeah. As, as, as I said, it's such an amazing record. Um, and obviously the cuts are great. And then kind of really flipping from someone's debut album. And I think this, this says a lot for you as a songwriter to someone's 70th album. Um, <laughs> Willie Nelson. I mean, even just saying that, what's that like for you? You had the title track of his most recent album, which, 
his 70th studio album. How on earth that them words are even coming out of my mouth. I think it's such a feat for him. For you, what was that like? Um, as I said, it shows such range. Um, but was it a complete bucket list moment? Oh, it's so hero bucket list, whatever you want to say. I mean, um, I've always felt like if an artist who is a really good songwriter cuts a song that you wrote and they're not a writer on it, mm -hmm. I always feel like that's a really big deal. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, Willie is, uh, the thing is, is he became such a persona and as an artist and as a presence, you know, uh, and most people know him as that. But uh, like Chris Christopherson still says to this day that Willie Nelson is the, is the best songwriter he's ever, he's ever been around. Yeah. And that was his first thing, his, his forte in the beginning. And, uh, you know, and Christopherson said, we all, you know, all the young guys in town, we were all, everybody wanted to, the big dog was Willie, man. Everybody mm -hmm. was trying to be a writer, songwriter like Willie. Mm -hmm. And so for him to cut that song, for me, I felt like, man, that's just such an amazing thing for me. And I think of my history and just the way I, I've thought of and looked at Willie over, over my life, you know, as a musician and, and how, you know, I played in bar bands, we play Willie Nelson songs, you know, and then went to LA and everybody knew Willie in LA and then Nashville, he's just, he's, he's a god in Nashville. And to finally get a, I mean, to get a cut, it was, it was so unexpected. And, uh, you know, uh, I wrote that with Alan Chamblin and Randy Hauser. Yeah. And Randy, you know, is a great artist. And uh, we wrote that about his wife's grandparents. And that was the story. And uh, we, did the, we did the work tape in the room uh, uh, at the, at, down at the publishing company. And when we were done, we, we, we walked, they were having a meeting in, in, the, in the conference room. And I said, you guys got to hear this, you know? So it was just the work tape. And we plugged the work tape into the, the sound system. We, they played the work tape. And everybody was like tearing up and and we were so excited about having written something that felt so real mm -hmm. about somebody that was real you know and everybody has grandparents you know and uh, and you could insert everybody's grandparents in that picture it's just a, a statement of love at an at at an age like that and and uh and he did, it, it was just a simple work tape, but Randy, Randy could kind of do kind of a Willie Nelson. I would listen to the work tape the other day. I hadn't listened in, in a while. And I listened, I go, shit, he's kind of got a, a Willie vibe on this yeah. thing. And, uh, you know, I don't know if this is true, but I, I heard that uh, Randy was going to cut it and Willie was going to, at least I, that's my memory of it. And Willie was going to sing on the song with him. And then mm -hmm. Willie heard the song and said, Man, I want to cut it. <laughs> and you don't say no. <laughs> and Randy said, "Okay, what are you going to say no to Willie Nelson?" Yeah. But uh, he sent us a little video of Willie sitting in the backyard, thanking him for the song and that how much he loved it. And it was yeah. That was just like man. I mean, that's, yeah. That just like made that just made made me feel so damn good. I mean, if you never write another song again, you've got yeah. Willie Nelson come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and his age and stuff, I thought, man, this might even be his last record. I don't know, you yeah. know? I mean, what is he, 86? 80? Something five? along the, I mean, yeah, I mean, 70, 70 albums. Yeah, Just so there's, there's a lot of years in there with where he did more than one album in a year. Yeah, just unbelievable. I mean, what an incredible thing to be able to say. Amazing. Yeah. All right, a song for Willie. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying Willie's amazing. I'm not saying I'm amazing, but I, it's amazing luck for me. Amazing luck for me. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing song. Um, I'm going to have to start wrapping things up a little bit now, but I cannot let you go without talking about um, my favourite song of this year, hands down, um, and that is Trouble With Forever. Uh, for anyone that has listened to this show, We've spoken about it a lot. We had Hilary Reynolds on who wrote next to you on the album and she expressed her love for it 
we had co-writer Jason Zions on the show and we spoke about it with him. So I have to get your take on it. Um, it is the final song on Little Big Town's Nightfall record and it's the most beautiful song ever. Um, I know it's quite a personal song to you um, from what I've heard. So can you just give me your take on that song? Well, uh, I'd been thinking about that for a while and, and uh, Sarah and Jason were exactly who to write that with. They totally got what we were trying to say. Yeah. We just had to decide what kind of vignettes we would create that would be appropriate. And, and, and I just said, we have to, could we end it like with an old couple, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, that was my, you know, that was my parents. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, you know, so we just really, you know, I, I, I loved, you know, sometimes you, you can bring up an idea in a room and it doesn't work. Or sometimes you bring up an idea and everybody gets it and, and they all light up and you realize, oh, this is exactly the group. This is, yeah. the, this is the, these are the people, man. And they were, I mean, I love both of them very, very much. And we had so much fun. That was actually the first song that the three of us wrote together. Yeah, amazing. Not that you'd be able to tell. It, I mean, it's incredible. And then Little, Little Big Town did an incredible record of it. There again, we go back to what, we were, what I was mentioning before, how crucial it is that an artist does, a, really captures the song. Yeah. And I think uh, I was talking obviously to Jason a lot about this. It is so perfect for that record. Um, and for that vibe and such a beautiful song as you said it was it was cut so so well um, and that was just your first Little Big Town song is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah and yeah. incredible I know every songwriter I've spoken to quite a few songwriters that have worked with them and just said how amazing they are so amazing amazing song. Thank you yeah. you're very good. Um, so I know you're gonna uh, play a song for us but I'm gonna kind of end with, uh, with three questions that I ask everybody. Okay. They're all about three. So my first question for you is, um, can you name three songs that you wish you'd have written? Oh, God. Um, okay. Wichita Lineman. Uh, Jimmy Webb. Uh, I can't make you love me. Mike Reed and Alan Shamblin. Mm -hmm. um, God, I mean, boy, it's really hard to narrow it down. There's so many, so many songs. I think maybe um, Desperado, Don Henley, and Glenn Fry. Yeah, what a song! What a song! Um, and then three albums that you you couldn't live without. Oh wow. Um, I could tell you albums that totally influenced me. Yeah. Like one in particular when I was young, Bookends, Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah. Wow. That's the album with uh, Mrs. Robinson and America. And, yeah. And Hazy Shade of Winter. Mm -hmm. It's it's that's a, that was that record grabbed me big time. Uh, uh, Let's see, For Every Man, Jackson Brown. Mm -hmm. um, boy, there's so many. And I guess, I guess I'd have to say Hotel California. Yeah. I had a feeling that was going to come up. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, you know, no, that it's, was, I, those were my influences. Yeah, there were, other, there were other things too. But I, I mean, those are the ones that just like went, just spoke to me. Yeah. And what great great records they are um and then finally three artists or writers that you haven't had a chance to work with but you'd really like to work with wow um that i haven't had a chance to work with um hmm. uh 
I think it'd be, I mean, I don't, it's funny. I don't ever really think about working with artists. I don't really work with artists much. I, wor yeah. I work with songwriters. Oh, so, songwriters, yeah. Song I mean, songwriters. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, I just, uh, uh, I mean, I think, uh, let's see. Um, I actually wrote with her once a long time ago, but I'd like to work with uh, Casey Musgraves. Yeah. And I, she's such a good songwriter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, I'm I'm tending to think about the ones that you could actually work with, where you where you write with them. You know, yeah. uh, they aren't necessarily people that I have, that I haven't worked with, but um, I loved I loved writing with Sam too. I mean, I just I hold him in such high regard. Mm -hmm. His craft as a songwriter is just it's just impeccable, and uh, and I I learned so much in the room with him. Uh, you know, in terms of cuts, I've always I've never had a Tim McGraw cut. I'd love to get a Tim McGraw cut. Yeah. I've never got a Trisha Yearwood cut. Trisha Yearwood was like my, it's to, to me, uh, the women of the 90s, they were the, they were the shit, man. Yeah. Winona <laughs> and, and, uh, and Trisha and, and Martina and Reba, Patty Loveless. I mean, that was a group of women that were pretty stunning. Yeah. pretty stunning artistically and they didn't write any of those songs no, i know it's what a, what a flip because you you don't get a lot of everyone now you know yeah. all these new artists right. they do a lot of them write for themselves um but you look back and they didn't you know as you, as you were saying they didn't write all their own songs but what incredible women and what incredible songs well they were great <laughs> Well, they were great artists and they were also, and they also knew what they wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And I always, I always felt like if you got to cut on one of them, that's like an extension of the songwriting process right there. Because they deliver it like they were in the room when you wrote it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So I guess I'm kind of vague on the artist thing, but that's, you know, I don't no. think, I don't really think in those terms. Um, and plus, I'm a lot older than everybody, so some of the people I want to work with are either in wheelchairs or dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. You can still write a song in a wheelchair. <laughs> True. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go because we've got to wrap up, but I know you're going to play a song for us if you are happy to. But thank you so much um, for the stories and the songs. Um, it's been absolutely incredible. Um, but I will, I will leave the stage to you. It was my pleasure, Leah. Thank you so much. And I uh, honestly, I haven't, I haven't been able to play out or anything. I haven't played songs in so long. So I was thinking about this morning. I thought, I'm going to have to use a cheat sheet because I can't. I <laughs> songs. I haven't done anything. But anyway, uh, this song um, is a five-year-old song that I wrote with Josh Osborne and Alan Shamblin. And uh, I happened to play it pre-pandemic, right before the pandemic for Dan one night. And I was over at his house, at Dan Huff's house. And uh, I didn't even know that Rascal Flats was even looking or that it was the end of, that they were gonna retire or anything. I didn't know any of that stuff. And uh, I played him the demo of this song and he said, he said, you know, he said, that might be the, just the kind of song that they wanna sing right now at the end of this at the end of their career and, and uh, that was back when they still had a big tour going and uh, anyway this song was recorded entirely during the pandemic it's a, a pandemic recording they cut everything separately Dan started out um, um, started with the just built a basic track that everybody could play with and he had a drummer play on it and then Jay did his thing. And uh, I think the only thing, um, I think maybe Joe Don and Jay might've got together to do the background vocals, but I think uh, Gary, Gary went over to Dan's house and sang, sang the lead, but everything else was done remotely. Uh, so this is this record, you know, and I, I'm telling you, I, I love this record. I think they did a great job on the record. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Rascal Flats is their single right now. And, uh, so let's see if I can pull this off. I'm going to have to use a cheat sheet. I'm sorry, Leah. Go for it. 
whoever's watching. But anyway. <laughs> Spread my name on the water tower, carved it in an old cottonwood tree. I signed a bunch of high school yearbooks so they wouldn't forget about me. It wasn't until I saw my daddy's name in stone I knew. It ain't a question of if they will, it's how they remember you. Did you stand or did you fall? Build a bridge or build a wall? Hide your love or give it all? Did you do? Did you do? Did you make them laugh or make them cry? Did you quit or did you try? Give your dreams or let them die? Did you choose? Or did you choose? When it all comes down, it ain't if it's how they remember you. When you're down to your last dollar, will you give or will you take? When a stiff wind blows the hardest, will you bend or will you break? You're gonna leave a legacy no matter what you do. It ain't a question of if they will, it's how they remember you. Did you stand or did you fall? Build a bridge or build a wall? Hot your love or give it all? Did you do? What did you do? Did you make them laugh or make them cry? Did you quit or did you try? Did you dreams or let them die? What did you choose? What did you choose? When it all comes down, it ain't it. It's